It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. After the podcast, check out our other episodes, all our Bible study resources, videos, download the CQ app, and more at ChristianQuestions.com. Today's topic is, whose voices are you listening to? Coming up in this episode... There are voices everywhere in our tech-filled world, and they never stop speaking. They're often angry, opinionated, rude, and demeaning. Whether we realize it or not, they are overwhelming. How do we learn to turn them down enough to hear and follow the wise, just, and loving voice of God? Now, here's Rick, Jonathan, and Julie. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rick. I'm joined by Jonathan, my co-host for over 20 years. Grateful to be with you. And Julie, a longtime CQ contributor, is also with us. Intriguing topic today, gentlemen. Jonathan, what's our theme scripture for today's episode? Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Technology brings the world to the palm of your hand. And this means we are bombarded with voices, worldly voices of opinion, anger, politics, perspective, ego, trends, and personal interpretations of morality. If you have technology in your life, it is virtually impossible to completely shut these voices out. On the other hand, we have the voice of God through his word and through his people. This voice is powerful, but quiet. It is relevant, but subtle. It is nourishing, but it seems outdated. It is transformative in a very positive way, but it is also laughed at as out of touch. So how do we identify the voices around us and then intentionally choose those we will listen to? And folks, this is a tough question. This is a big subject and we're going to work really hard at putting it in perspective so we can really understand the voices around us and what choices we make as to what we listen to. So let's look at our first example of listening to a voice other than God's. It was Eve in the garden. Her fateful conversation with Satan set a sinful trend for heeding that which is contrary to God's will. So Jonathan, let's get started with this. First, Satan baited Eve in Genesis 3. We're going to read 3 verses 1 to 6 in a few parts. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You should not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, he has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Yeah, everything was perfect until somebody contradicted God. So next, next, Satan enlightens her with a massive lie mixed with some truth. Verse 4 and 5. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Had a little bit of truth in there and a massive lie. So this, quote, enlightenment, unquote, was a challenge and a deception. Eve was now refocused on the wrong things. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Okay, let, let's pause right there. She saw all of this. So her new focus led to a decision, and that decision was to walk away from God. Now finish the verse. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So you have Satan's voice, and he's following. But you also have in the scripture describing her own voice. So she's listening to her voice, which is based on the voice of Satan. And here we have two voices that are contrary to God. Adam and Eve's choice was fundamentally wrong. They violated the basic moral principle of listening only to the voice of God. And for us... That same moral pres premise exists today, only we're bound to listen only to God's voice through his written word. And this does include the voices of those who stand for his will and his plan as well. So in this case, whose voice dominated this decision to sin? Well, Satan. He seemed logical and drew our attention subtly. 
So we've got to ask ourselves, are we listening to Satan without even realizing it? And are we listening to Satan without realizing it and then adding our own voice to make it a chorus? I mean, you have to ask yourself this as we, as we open up this subject. Now look, many times in Scripture, God warns his people to heed only his words and his precepts. And he does this many times in Scripture. Here is one example, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. And it just gives you a sense of God's Word can be all around you and influencing you at every part of your life if you choose it to be that voice of influence. And these warnings were constantly there throughout the scriptures to counter the power of other voices of sinful influence. So this is a dilemma. This is a big dilemma. How do we handle the voices? To work through this dilemma, we're going to look at three things. First, we're going to quote an article about the deceptively powerful influence of electronic media. Secondly, we're going to look at how Jesus responded to the scribes and the Pharisees who exercised the power and voice to corrupt the nation of Israel. So they had a voice that was powerful and influential, influential, and it was corrupting those who were listening, even though it was disguised as being godly. And then third, and most importantly, we're going to look at scriptural solutions to the serious challenge we face of being surrounded by only, uh, ungodly voices. So first, let's do an introduction to the research. Julie, what do we have here? So we're going to reference a term called moral disengagement. Moral disengagement is a cognitive mechanism, and that's the way the brain works, and that detaches our internal moral standards from our actions, allowing us to engage in unethical behavior without feeling distress. So a common example is how video games, they allow a player to practice moral disengagement when killing is required to advance in the game. So it reduces the discomfort we feel from the dissonance of a situation. We're going to be quoting throughout this episode from an article called Morality and Media Effects, published at ResearchGate.net. Let's start with the first quote. Moral standards are learned by witnessing the co-occurrence of behaviors and consequences associated with them. Repeatedly viewing rewards and punishments associated with specific behaviors leads individuals to develop standards of behavior. These self-sanctions encourage individuals to enact behaviors that are consistent with internal moral standards and to inhibit behaviors that are inconsistent. However, through moral disengagement, individuals may overcome the inhibitory effects of self-sanctions, end so, quote. Let, let's translate. We have moral standards that are inside of us, but we can be involved in things and observe things and listen to things and follow things that are different, and it can inhibit what we would normally say, no, shouldn't go there, and wear you down, and suddenly you're listening to a voice that's not the voice you originally were listening to. And, and we create, gain comfort in listening to those things and becoming a part of those things. So our comfort, what, what our comfort one, what once was, gets melted away and it's replaced by something that is actually vile. And you got to think about that because that's what happens and that's what some of these voices are. So that gives us a sense of, of some of the research that we're going to be continually going back to. And second... A review of Jesus' final attempt to get the scribes and Pharisees to see the errors of their ways in Matthew chapter 23. Remember, do what they say, but don't do what they do. <laughs> we will review seven of the eight woes that Jesus spoke in principle. That is, we will apply what they are doing to our current day voices that subvert truth and righteousness. After each review, we will take step three and look at scriptural solutions. So let's go to another quote from this article, Morality and Media Effects. Here's the quote. Moral disengagement is described primarily as a cognitive process. That's a thinking process. It's facilitated by seven mechanisms. Each of these mechanisms involves rationalization, either in a motivative cap capacity, which is before engaging in an act, or in a reactive capacity. That's after performing an act. So this first mechanism that helps us our brain and our hearts kind of disengage from morality is 
dehumanization. And that means referring to or thinking of victims as being less than human. And that's a serious, serious malady. So we're going to look at that in theory when we look at the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus' treatment of them in Matthew 23. Now, Matthew 23 is Jesus' last attempt to get them to see the error of their ways. Before this, he he discussed with them, he debated with them, he answered the questions and got nowhere. He's getting close to the point of crucifixion. This is his last-ditch effort to say, look at what you're doing. And here's what they were doing. By their teaching and example, these men, these scribes and Pharisees, were by their own design in a position to take financial advantage of the vulnerable and covered this by their appearance of piety. So they designed themselves to be in a position to take financial advantage of others. We know this, Matthew 23, 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So you devour widows' houses. What they did, the Pharisees did not treat these widows as equals. They treated them as gullible and vulnerable sources of income. I mean, come on. You're, you're picking on those who couldn't take care of themselves. You have the nerve to do that in the name of God. It's completely off. And, and so we're using this dehumanization to, to kind of connect to this. So, so that's where we're starting. So whose voice might this represent, and are we listening to it? All right. Does our world, let's let's bring it to the 21st century now, does our world have opinionated voices on various controversial subjects filled with name-calling and vitriol? Well, there's been much psychological, is what I meant to say, analysis of the Holocaust and what allowed so many ordinary people to act in such horrific ways even by just turning a blind eye to what was going on. Quoting from the 2011 book named Less Than Human by David Livingston Smith, quote, thinking sets the agenda for action and thinking of humans as less than human paves the way for atrocity. The Nazis were explicit about the status of their victims. They were subhumans and as such were excluded from the system of moral rights and obligations that bind humankind together. It's wrong to kill a person, but permissible to exterminate a rat. To the Nazis, all the Jews, gypsies, and others were rats, dangerous, disease-carrying rats, end quote. Well, Rick and Julie, it breaks my heart to read this. How evil Yes, and the idea of treating someone as subhuman, you know, separating them as the other has gone on throughout history, and it opens the door to cruelty and genocide. And in politics, opponents are routinely dehumanized, which means it's okay to treat people disrespectfully. After all, he's an idiot, she's delusional, and they're all unpatriotic morons who don't care about the facts. So tell me what you really feel, Julie. I mean, yeah, understand the value of looking at this and saying, wait a minute, hold on. Am I doing the same things that happened in Nazi Germany? And of course you say, no, no, of course not. Of course not. Really? Are you on the same road? Maybe you're not at the same, at the same exit, but are you on the same road? Are you going down that road of looking at people that are on the other side and the voices that you're hearing are encouraging you to look at them as less? Think. Think hard about this. What we need are scriptural guidelines to put us in order, to, to, put, things, to put things right, for hearing the right voices. So, Ma- uh, Jonathan, let's go to Matthew five forty three to 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love your enemies, you cannot possibly go down the road of dehumanizing them. You can't possibly go down the road of the name calling and the vitriol because you love them. To love them is not to feel nice about them. We're talking about loving them selflessly, to love them the way Jesus loved them. This is the way to counteract all of that stuff. This is the kind of voice we want to look at. So listening to the right voices, Jonathan, what do we have based on what we've looked at so far? A godly voice is not condemnatory or belittling, 
of others is it realizes that we are all sinners and we all need God's grace and the ransom of Jesus. When we hear any voice belittle or dehumanize another, we must intentionally stand against it. When we hear such things, folks, it's not enough to just shake, nod your head and say, oh, that's horrible, and just let it go. We need to stand up. We need to, to do something to say, this is not good. And that can be embarrassing, but really, let's think about what Jesus would have done in a situation like this. Stand up and intentionally say, nothing, it, we can't go there. We're better than that. So when we, when we think about all of this, standing for godly principles only begins to happen when we dedicate ourselves to knowing those principles. Not belittling someone else sounds like it should be easy. What about things that are more subtle? Well, the further we develop this question of identifying the voices we listen to, the more we're going to realize that none of this is easy. When we grow accustomed to certain things, those things eventually don't even show up on our warning radar. The worldly voices around us need close, intentional attention. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, pay, pay close attention. But often what happens when we're trying to pay attention is you get that eyes glazed over feeling, your brain gets glazed over, and, and because we're so used to hearing things, they just don't mean anything. We need to intentionally pay attention so we really grasp the, the, the things that we're, we're looking at and asking the question, is this a voice that I should be listening to? So we talked about dehumanization. Now the second mechanism, the morality and media effects article quoted for moral disengagement is minimizing, ignoring, or misconstruing consequences of actions. Okay. Minimizing, ignoring, or misconstruing consequences of actions. Let's go back to the Pharisees and the scribes. By their teaching and example, these men dedicated themselves to drawing new converts to follow them. But instead of humbly bringing those new converts before God, they brought those converts to the brink of destruction. You think, wait, wait. That's not supposed to be. You're right. It's not. In the name of God, they brought them down a road of destruction. Why do we know that? Because Jesus says that to them here and now, Matthew 23, verse 15. From the Young's Literal Translation, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye go round the sea and the dry land to make one proselyte, and whatever it may happen, you make him a son of Gehenna twofold more than yourselves. So you have the, the, the wrong conclusion for this action. It's good to draw people to join you, but when you're, they're, they're joining you to, to a road that's going against God, not a good thing. The Pharisees were only about their agenda of power, and it didn't matter to them who they might mislead. Mm, so whose voice might this represent, and are we listening to it? All right, so let's bring it up to the 21st century. Does our world get so caught up in their agenda that consequences to others become irrelevant. So we had a listener named Jessica email us at inspiration at christianquestions.com who was very distraught, and she wrote this. These last five years or so politically have made me a little ashamed to call myself Christian because I don't agree with a lot of the right-wing ideas, but I don't agree with all the left-wing either. We have all become so afraid to speak our mind or the opposite, ready to pounce on anyone who does, by canceling them, that I feel we are all doomed and it's only going to get worse and worse. I feel scared for my young kids and almost feel like maybe it was selfish of me to bring them into this world. It's spinning so out of control. I know God is here and in control, but it feels so dark. My daughter's four and is going to start asking questions and I want to be wise and not waver with my response. So we appreciate Jessica opening up to us and those various factions are screaming and demanding their rights, even if it's repeating the rights of someone else. We are faced with issues unheard of in previous times. The current issue, as an example, is a transgender swimmer at the University of Pennsylvania swim team who was shattering school records. This person competed as a male for three years and is being allowed to compete as a woman, anticipated to break national women's college records set by Olympic gold medalists. In demanding transgender rights, the biological women competing know they will lose no matter how much they work 
or they put into their training. So those who oppose this say that the integrity of women's sports are being destroyed and it's unfair to biological females. But those who support this say athletic ability varies. There's no evidence that playing on a team of their gender identity affects the sport. Those who participate in sports get better grades. They've got higher self-esteem. So it's really better for kids and young adults to participate. As of 2020, there is now legislation, Idaho's Fairness and Women's Sports Act, requiring transgender student athletes to compete in the sport, confirming to their gender assigned at birth. The American Civil Liberties Union sued to block its enforcement. So, Rick, you know, you can say just rise above this or don't let it bother you until it affects your daughter or your granddaughter or on the flip side, your transgender family member who just wants to swim. So what happens when your family or friends are living the headlines? That's a, that's a really, really hard question, Julie, but I appreciate putting it on the table. And, and look, I, I'm not in that situation, but what I would like to think that I would do if I was in that situation, if I had a, 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 a grandchild uh, who was in this situation and, and a male swing at, in, as a female because they, they're going through the, 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 uh, the transgender uh, sur- surgeries and all of that, I would hope that I would be able to sit down with them and talk through the whole situation with them and look at what's real and what's not in terms of, now when I say what's real and what's not, people can jump to all kinds of conclusions. Like, what are you trying to say? Well, in terms of the biology of the, the male body versus the biology of a female body, it's a provable fact that men are more endurance-oriented and men are stronger just naturally, especially when you're an athlete. And the question I would have to ask is, you're taking those natural things that you have and bring them into a situation that doesn't have it. Is that inherently fair to all of those others? I get that you want to be treated fairly, but what about the fairness of the others? I would want to be able to have that conversation. Don't know how it would go, but I hope that I would be strong enough to say, let's talk about this, and let's talk about fairness in the bigger picture. That's the, the, the best response that I can give it at, at this point. So it's a hard thing. This is a hard thing. There's no question about it. It's a very difficult thing. So let's go to some scriptural guidelines for hearing the right voices. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was the causing of the growth. We can be on different sides of issues, but what we want to do is find the, the ultimate harmony in what we want to do. The, the harmony with the transgender issue is finding the ultimate level of fairness and, and, and trying to treat everybody with respect. That's hard, and some will say it's impossible. I don't believe it's impossible. Just because we don't get our way doesn't make it not fair or not possible. It just makes it more difficult. So we need to put things in perspective. And in Christianity in the early days, there were factions, and they had to rise above their differences to find the higher good. So as we look at this, Jonathan, listening to the right voices, what do we have? A godly voice will always draw others to God and never draw them to some poor representation or skewed perspective of who God is. Whenever we hear a voice that draws us to some agenda or practices that are not of the highest order, run the other way. Yeah, and it's important because, you know, when voices draw us to an agenda or practices that we see are not as high as godliness should be, we, we can look at the label and say, well, these are people who are representing thus and so. But sometimes labels are like headlines and they're not reliable. Most headlines don't tell you what's in the article. They just get you to read it. Most labels don't tell you what's behind the person. They just get you to pay attention. We need to be careful and clear on these things. So let's move on. That morality and media effects article quoted for moral disengagement, dehumanization, minimizing and ignoring consequences of our actions. And here's the third one, attribution of blame. That means blaming the victim for the transgressor's action. And that's a pretty serious thing. That happens a lot. And, and, you know, the Pharisees were good at this. By their teaching example, these men, these scribes and Pharisees, they took the sacred things from God above and reinterpreted them 
as mere details of spirituality. And what this did is it took the focus off of God and put it on things. And I say, well, what are you talking about? Well, let's look at the example that Jesus gives when he's presenting these woes to this hypocritical behavior by the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23, 16 and 17. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important? the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold. And, and Jonathan, to, to help explain the scripture and, and the principle of what we're looking at, let's take a look at, uh, at some commentary from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Striking expression of the ruinous effects of erroneous teachings. Our Lord here, and in some following verses, condemns the subtle distinctions they make as to the sanctity of oaths distinctions invented only to promote their own avaricious purposes. So they were creating distinctions that didn't need to exist to make them bigger and stronger and more powerful and the average person less. And they're looking at the people and they're blaming them for not being able to do it right because they keep changing the rules. That's what's happening. And, and, and they're doing it in the name of God. This is not good. The Pharisees manipulated the details of truth to show their self-proclaimed superiority in knowledge and in action. And whose voice might this represent, and are we listening to it? Fast forward to the 21st century. Does our world place personal thought over big picture facts as a way to place the blame of ignorance or heartlessness on those they oppose? Okay. okay. I'm going to say a word that will trigger people on one side or the other. I'm going to call it a trigger bomb and give you an incoming warning. <laughs> You've been warned, vaccines. Oh, great. So do we look down on people on the other side and blame them for what's happening? You know, we each have our own firm idea of whether or not to take the vaccine for coronavirus, and the people on the other side are quite simply wrong. But there's fear on both sides, and each side has their own experts, their own doctors and scientists giving opposing facts. And to mandate vaccines or you lose your job or can't go to a restaurant is repulsive to many who say their liberty is being trampled on, and it's all of governmental ex uh, conspiracy of control. You know, give an inch here and what's next? Others say that's a public health issue, not a personal liberty issue. Like, think about how we mandate seatbelts in cars. You know, the government has to step in and keep you from hurting those around you. So are vaccines a dangerous medical experiment or are they the greatest public health advance in the history of medicine? Is it immoral and not loving your neighbor if you don't get vaccinated? You know, that's what the Archbishop of Canterbury said recently. And on Twitter, his statements were called an utterly divisive, coercive, hateful rant. Our personal opinions on issues like vaccines and mandates get us in trouble when we start to degrade dehumanize and point blame. These are big issues and the voices behind the issues are loud, convincing and are littered with inaccuracy. We can't get to the point where we are stooping to name calling and even hatred, even if it's just in our own minds and we never actually say the words out loud. Yeah, that's really important because our internal voice can affect us as much as our external voice because we've essentially created another godless voice to listen to. Ugh, this is so hard because as Christians, we aren't even supposed to be thinking hurtful things about someone else. So can we be so tied up in these voices we're listening to that we lose sight of scriptural principles? We're supposed to represent what's higher, but what is higher in this case? And you know what? What's higher in this case is there's a human being on the other side of the issue. That's what's higher in this case. Like it or not, if they're delusional or not, I don't care. What we should care about is the fact that they're trying, and maybe they're wrong. And you know what? I don't care which side you, you think I'm on. doesn't matter. Take what we're saying and apply it to yourself. Do I look at that other person across the table and say, let me try and figure out what really is, is their issue, what really they're thinking about, and let me listen to what their sources are. And maybe I think, boy, they're really full of it. But listen, and listen, here's an idea. Listen to learn. Listen to follow. Listen to see if you can accept. Maybe you can't, and that's okay. But if you listen with the intent of absorbing, the person you're listening to may in fact have that same respect for you 
but you have to wait your turn. So this is a back and forth thing where we can change the dialogue by changing the attitude, by being an actual Christian. That's what this is about. It's about equality. It's about putting things on the table and loving that person to say, let's work through this together. So we've got this big, massive, massive issue here, and we need to figure out what to do with it. So let's get some scriptural guidelines on the table. So Jonathan, let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And we can't use that great privilege we have in Christ to batter our brethren. No, and, and that's the point. The, the privilege of liberty is enormous. And it can be a club or it can be a welcoming handshake. Which do you choose to make your liberty in Christ? And which approach do you think Jesus would look at and say, bless you, my, my, my son, my, my child. Bless you, bless you, my brother, for taking that approach. We do this through love. Jonathan, listening to the right voices, what do we have? A godly voice will never override or overgovern another's freedom of conscience. Instead, it will show what true God-honoring actions look like. Whenever we hear a voice that boxes others in with misrepresented commands from Scripture, we need to soberly consider the source and act accordingly. We want to have a godly voice that, does, that, that has complete respect for another's conscience. Now, maybe their conscience is not right. So have respect for their conscience. Communicate with them so you can influence them positively. And here's a hint. Beating somebody down never helps them to stand up. It just doesn't. We need to be better than that. It is a serious matter to be a voice that draws others away from God. We need to think before we speak. Obviously, many voices can lead us astray. What about the voices of moral justification? Human beings want to be right, and we don't want to have to change to do so. We all have the challenge of looking at ourselves and determining how much of our behavior is to make us look right in our own eyes versus making us right in the eyes of God. Facing this can be a massive challenge. So again, how much of our behavior is to make us look right in our own eyes versus making us right in the eyes of God? Making us right in the eyes of God requires humility and change. So this fits perfectly into the fourth mechanism of moral disengagement from the morality and media effects article we're quoting. Moral justification meaning providing reasons for immoral behavior. We've got some really good reasons why we should do this. Yes, we do. We always do. We just always do. And let's go back to the scribes and the Pharisees. By their teaching and example, these men, these scribes and Pharisees, they led others toward an outward show of compliance and godliness based on small details they made to appear as large and important. So they took little things and they made them look really big. This took attention away from those things that actually showed a God-honoring heart. And in in, in the end, they were leading others away from God. We know this because Jesus tells us this in Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Well, Rick, what does straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel mean? (laughs) Yeah, Jesus is using some sarcasm here, but he's using something that's very, very important. Strain out a gnat. You know, gnat, a little tiny, tiny little fly. If you get a gnat in your soup, you you know, you you don't want to eat it, obviously. So you, you meticulously strain it out. And sometimes you miss it. You know, how many gnats have you, face it, folks, how many gnats have you eaten in your lifetime, okay? It happens. You know, but they're, they're, they're so focused on that little thing. But he says, you do that and you swallow a camel. Now, how can anybody swallow a camel? It's sarcasm. A camel, first of all, is, uh, by the law, was an unclean animal. So he's saying, you're so worried about that little tiny gnat and you are swallowing unclean things whole without even giving it a second thought. 
So he's showing how far off they were. The Pharisees took great pains to show themselves as fulfilling the law in extraordinary detail when, in fact, they were putting on a show to hide the destructiveness of their lifestyle. Okay, so who, whose voice might this represent, and are we listening to it? Remember, our fourth point for moral disengagement was moral justification, meaning to prove reasons for our immoral behavior. Now, there's a psychology involved with immorality, and some basic issues are one ethical act opens the door to other ethical acts. It's a slippery slope because sin begets sin. And next, there's a small price to pay as a cost of doing business. And you know, the ends justify the means. And we don't believe what we are doing is wrong. And human beings like to help each other. And when we help others, we don't see what we are doing as unethical. For example, here in the United States, we test car emissions. If your car fails, it is, to, it is um, too polluting to stay on the road. A study by Harvard Business School found that between 20 and 50 percent of cars are passed that are really failed. You have a better chance of passing if you drive a Honda Civic than an expensive car like a BMW or Ferrari. The testers who earn a modest salary feel empathy for the Civic drivers, committing fraud not because they're greedy, but because they're nice. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It, it is. It is. It, it, it's an interesting thing to, to look at that and to say, you know, what, what harm could there be in that? Because you're just trying to be nice. Well, yeah, you are. But legality is important as well. And we need to be nice in the context of legality. Anyway, now that we understand more about what moral justification is, let's ask a question related back to those Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees that were worried about the gnats but swallowing unclean things whole without giving it a second thought? Here's the question for us here and now. Do our spiritual leaders in our world, in our communities, preach to others the way things ought to be while at the same time living according to an entirely different standard? Yeah, well, that's a great question because we can point to nearly any Christian sect, and we've all seen the headlines of sexual abuse, the extramarital affairs, the misappropriation of funds, and really general corruption in leadership. Prosperity gospel preachers bully the faithful into donating their last dime in order to support their luxury cars, their homes, their boats. It's disgusting. But what do we do when there's so much corruption in church leadership? The faithful Christian wants to do what's right. But who do we listen to? Every leader is going to be flawed by virtue of them being human. So what do we do? How do we listen to our clergy? Well, here's what we do. We try to listen to the right voices. And if we're not seeing the voice of God and the voice of the Word of God in, in an appropriate way where we are, then we need to go to some place where we can find it. You don't stay where what's being preached and told to you is contrary to the Word and will of God. It's simple. It really is simple. It might be hard to do, but it's a simple process. We need to learn to walk away from such things. And, and that's an important aspect in this whole thing. So, so let's, let's put some scriptural uh, guideline to this as well. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. See, these are the kinds of things that we cannot tolerate for ourselves. We may not be in a position to call them out, but we can be in a position to walk away. And that's something we need to understand very clearly, is if we are Christians, and we profess to be true Christians, true disciples of Jesus, that means we are following the will of God, period. There is no exception. There is no watering down. There is no rationalization. It is following the will of God. And if, the, if what we're being taught doesn't jive, then we have to think about what else to do. Listening to the right voice, Jonathan, what do we have? A godly voice is not only living the humility it wants you to live, it is providing a marked example of what true discipleship looks like. Whenever we hear a voice that boasts dramatic and humble service, we need to look elsewhere for spiritual guidance. Yeah, whenever you're hearing a, vo a, a, a voice boasting about the drama of its humility, something just is not adding up, okay? Those are not ingredients that fit in the same godly sentence. So be aware and decide that you need to move forward. 
Is that like, look at how humble I am? Yes, look at my great example of humility so you can all follow it. Uh, no, that's, did Jesus ever say that? No, let's, let's, no. let's, let's, let's put this mm-hmm. in perspective. Julie, what's next? So we all have those, remember, justifications for being immoral, but we have this fifth ne- mechanism of moral disengagement, and that is euphemistic language. That means describing an immoral act in softer language, because, you know, once we blur the line, we can never really be sure if we've crossed it or not. <laughs> softer language. It's so subtle. And, you know, by their teaching and example, the scribes and Pharisees hid what they did and why. Outwardly, they looked like they were squeaky clean and God-honoring, but inside were the stains of their dark and selfish plans and purposes. Very strong accusations here on the part of Jesus, Matthew 23, 25 to 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. So I want to pause here for a moment because, you know, as as we're going through this, uh, Trish walked in and she handed me a note and she says, you know, Jesus sounds pretty strong and condemning. Shouldn't we be the same? And it's a great question because you're looking at this and are we feeding a voice that says, go beat them down? The question is, are you Jesus? Are you in a position to make judgments the way he did? Can you read the heart the way he, he can? Because if you can't, then no, you can't do that. Jesus not only had a right to be hard on them, he had a responsibility to be hard on them because they were the leaders of the Jewish nation and they were leading them away from God and he was standing for what was right. It was his responsibility and his obligation and this was his last ditch effort to save them and they just wouldn't listen. So I'm glad we had that question put it out there. The Pharisees showed themselves to the people as living their lives with deep appreciation for the Jewish law, but in fact, they were corrupt leaders with ungodly intentions and ungodly agendas. Those are the facts. That's what Jesus tells us. And I love that phrase that, Jonathan, you read, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Isn't that a condemnation to them? So whose voice might this represent, and are we listening to it? Let's move to the 21st century. Do we, now let's look at something specific here, do we in our social media world present ourselves as living the dream when in fact we're not? Do we stimulate competitiveness and jealousy as a way to feel better about our own broken selves? Well, to answer this, I'm thinking about the euphemistic language, you know, describing an immoral act in softer language. You know, that freedom of immorality is built into the fabric of our advertising, cable, streaming television shows, and social media. Sinful acts are normalized and they're accepted and personal accountability is invalid because it's not my fault. It was the way I was raised. It doesn't hurt anyone. Well, this is just how society is and perhaps the most dangerous Yeah, it's really no big deal. And again, we're less likely to be strict with those that we like. So everyone wants to do what they want, but no one wants to be judged for it. Hmm. And social media is this weird, strange animal because on one hand, we are free to portray ourselves any way we deem appropriate. Even if it's all smoke and mirrors or outright lies, where nothing's really shocking anymore. But on the other hand, the crowd mercilessly bullies what they don't like and is judge and executioner. Well, are we allowing what we see and hear in the media to influence where our right and wrong lines are going to be drawn? Hmm. Will we listen to those voices that say, it's really no big deal? So what are we allowing our ears to be tuned to? And we submit to you that what you're allowing is what's around you all the time. And you've got to be incredibly careful because especially with social media, it sounds so common. It sounds so, 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 so real. It sounds so enticing. It sounds so normal. It sounds so natural. But is it right? Is it godly? Am, is my voice now beginning to sing in harmony with the social media chorus? Because if it is, then the voices that we're listening to, including our own, are leading us deeply astray. We, 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 need, we need to be put this in clear, clear perspective. This is so important. 
So important that, again, we need scriptural guidelines for hearing the right voices. And folks, understand, the scriptural guidelines are the key to making all of this work. And a great episode to listen to on this is episode 992. It was called, Are We Sure Sin is Really Sinful? It was about learning to handle situation ethics in light of biblical principles. So just type 992 in the search bar at christianquestions.com or in the Christian Questions app. So again, let's go back to scriptural guidelines. uh, Jonathan, let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But from the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we would do not grow weary. Well, Rick, uh, God will not be mocked. We can't grow weary of doing good. It matters. It does matter. And how do you mock God? You mock God by your words, and you mock God by your actions. God will not be mocked. In other words, whatever your words and actions are, if they stand against God, there is judgment for that later. You will be held accountable. You will have to make right that which you did in a wrong way. So especially if we're Christians— we had better be incredibly careful about what we're listening to, what we're thinking about, and what we're repeating, because those voices can lead us from God, not to Him. Listening to the right voices, Jonathan, what do we have? A godly voice is a voice of truth and encouragement, and is not interested in being anything else. Whenever we hear a voice that is boastful or self-aggrandizing or competitive, we need to consider the ego that would fuel such messages. Is that the input you want? Is that the input you want, that self-aggrandizing, competitive approach? Or do you want a voice of truth and encouragement that's not interested in anything but truth and encouragement? That's a godly voice. The question is, what are we listening to? Obviously, voices that are peppered with ego are also peppered with damaging messages. Stay away from them. Are the voices we listen to telling us to embrace the responsibility we have for our life or hide from it. As Christians, it always seems to come down to two things. First, being responsible for what we think, do, and say. And second, being humble while we accept that responsibility. It's always the same things. This can be a never-ending challenge because we as imperfect humans would sometimes just let all of this go. After all, no one will know. It's like Jonathan and Julie, what you were talking about before. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to care. Who? It, why make such a big deal? It's just not so big. Yes, it is. If you are standing for Christ, yes, it is. Now, the article six point on moral disengagement is displacement or diffusion of responsibility. And that means placing responsibility on others. Okay placing responsibility on others. Let's go back to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. By their teaching and example, these men were self-serving hypocrites, and that's a strong word, but that's the word Jesus uses. They were hypocrites whose appearance was that of godly men, but they were in fact godless in their desires and in their actions. Matthew 23, 27, and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So Jesus is talking about whited sepulchers, whited tombs. Why is he using this as an example? Jonathan, there's some good commentary by Albert Barnes on this. Sepulchers were therefore often whitewashed, that they might be distinctly seen. Thus whited, they appeared beautiful, but within they contained the bones and corrupting bodies of the dead. So the Pharisees, their outward conduct appeared well, but their hearts were full of hypocrisy, envy, pride, lust, and malice, fitly represented by the corruption within a whited tomb. So they whited the tombs to warn people to stay away from them. They look great but stay away because inside is death. Jesus was plain. You can dress up the outside, but that does not change what's inside. In their actions, the Pharisees were children of Satan as they pursued what they themselves wanted, just like Satan. 
That's serious. So whose voice might this represent and are we listening to it? Let's move forward. Do our social media examples promote things that they live by that are deadly to us under the guise of acceptability and aspiration? So now we're looking at those people who are social media examples. I've got two important examples here. The first is uh, an article that I was just reading about teens and young adults using TikTok videos to self-diagnose mental illness like borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, and multiple personality disorder. These are being viewed hundreds of millions of times, reinforcing that they have these issues when they really don't. And a recent Wall Street Journal investigation showed that TikTok's algorithms can tell how long you linger on a video. And then it shows more and more of the same reinforcing content, making it difficult for mental health workers to treat the actual problem. Yeah, and with mental health issues, they are so complicated, you need professional help. This idea, folks, if you have teenagers that are going down that road, stop it immediately because all they're doing is damaging themselves. They're damaging their own self-image because they're portraying things. They're believing that they are something that who knows that they are. And, and, and percentage-wise, there's such a tiny percentage of people that fall into those categories. Chances are your teenager is just depressed or anxious. That's it. Please, please don't let that happen. And if they are going down that road, have them see somebody who can help them understand things in, in a real perspective. And as a second example, quoting from blog.malwarebytes.com, and all sources are going to be shown in this week's CQ Rewind show notes. Here's the quote. Research conducted by Facebook revealed that Instagram makes body image issues worse for about one in three girls and that teenagers blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression and that one in five teenagers said that Instagram makes them feel worse about themselves. It was also revealed that a percentage of female teens in the U.S. and the U.K. have suicidal thoughts over what they see on Instagram. And here's another one. In Facebook's 2019 research report, it found that 14% of boys in the U.S. had said that Instagram made them feel bad about themselves. The following year, they found that 40% of teen boys experienced negative social comp comparisons. 40%. And the blog continued with this quote, as computer scientist Dr. Cal Newport said in his memorable TED talk called Why You Should Quit Social Media, social media is designed to provide a constant flow of small intermittent rewards, just like a slot machine. Newport says it's one thing to spend a couple of hours at a slot machine in Las Vegas. But if you bring one into bed with you and you pull that handle all day long from when you wake up to when you go to bed. We're not wired for that, end quote. So in other words, the voice of social media is so loud that people can't function without it. So those in positions of influence allow that influence to go awry, to be very damaging. And folks, we have to understand, these are voices that we are hearing, that our relatives are hearing, that our friends are hearing, that our, that our families are hearing, that our church members are hearing, what are we doing about it? Do we stand and say, wait, is this a godly voice? Is this something we should be pursuing? Or is there something better? Is there something higher? We need to always look higher. So again, let's go back to scriptural guidelines because we need the voice of God. And we actually have two scriptures here because there's two parts uh, of the point to, to deal with. So Jonathan, first is Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So all of the social media stuff, love has nothing to do with it. It's about making money. Face the fact, it's about popularity and making money. We're supposed to walk in love. We're supposed to look to draw people higher because we actually care about them, not what they can pay us. What's the second piece? Romans 8, 6 to 8. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you see how important that scripture is? It says the flesh cannot even subject itself to God. It doesn't know how because it's broken. So we have to use that spirituality to draw us to a higher level and to have a positive influence on those around us as well. Please recognize those voices and say enough is enough. 
time to turn the volume down, turn the volume off, and pull those around us up higher. Listening to the right voices, Jonathan, what do we have? A godly voice is a voice that rings true to discipleship and reflects a genuine character from the inside out. Any voice that has a ring of self-service or worldly peer pressure is not godly, but in fact, sin-driven. Such voices should not be entertained. We need to make the choice to not entertain the voice that doesn't represent our God through his word and the principles laid out therein. So finally, the article's seventh point on moral disengagement is exonerative comparison, and that is favorably comparing one's moral violation to those of others. All right. What does that mean? (laughs) Well, let's take a look. By their teaching example, the Pharisees and the scribes, these men proclaim themselves righteous above their fathers, above their ancestors. And Jesus lays this out very plainly in Matthew 23, verses 29 to 33. And this is from the Young's Literal Translation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the sepulchres of the prophets and adorn the tombs of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets, so that ye testify to yourselves that ye are the sons of them who did murder the prophets, and ye, ye fill up the measure of your fathers, serpents, brood of vipers, how may ye escape from the judgment of the Gehenna? You know, when Jesus calls them serpents, it's not an accident. Satan was represented in a serpent in the garden. He was the beguiler, the liar. And he's saying, you are saying to, to, to everybody, if we were there, we wouldn't have rejected the prophets. And yet here they are, ready to crucify their Messiah. He is trying to save them from themselves, but they are so deep in, in, the, in, their, in their own agenda, they're lost. They were so self-righteous. They saw themselves above everyone else. And yet there they are, not too long after this, they're, they're, they're instilling in the crowd, crucify him, crucify him. Mm, and whose voice might this represent? And are we listening to it? Finally, our last example in our world now, in the 21st century, the pa- uh, are we in our world judging the past as irrelevant and full of failure why we, by our decisions and adoption of personal morality, destroy the very fabric of the goodness of humanity. So, Jonathan, what's our example here? Well, here's another trigger bomb, depending on your opinion on this topic, the toppling of statues. There are big debates all over the world about the rewriting or covering up of history or trying to right the wrongs of history by tearing down statues representing people or ideas that are no longer valued when viewed through the lens of today. So this is a big issue, and those in favor of removing statues say they glorify the wrong ideal and they're a painful reminder of the past. There are other people who would better represent progress and diversity. And here in the United States, many of the statues in contention represent our painful past of slavery during the Civil War. Now, those in favor of leaving the statues say, well, removing them doesn't change history, but it does censor it. And it starts to remove it for the next generations, even if the past is complicated. To judge historical characters with today's social values isn't appropriate, they would say. Statues don't cause racism or communism or any other ism and can be used as learning tools about contentious issues. Well, the big question is, who gets to decide which parts of history are worth remembering? That's exactly right. And there's a reason why we don't see statues to Hitler. And frankly, if I'm a black person, I don't want to see a statue glorifying a Civil War general who fought to enslave my ancestors as I walk to the grocery store every day. That's offensive. But on the flip side, just this month, a monument in Hong Kong was removed under a Chinese city crime ordinance. It was dedicated to victims of the Tiananmen Square pro-democracy movement where an unknown number of civilians were murdered in 1989. Now, most here in the United States would consider the whitewashing of that event to be dangerous to civil liberties. So what history do we keep? What history do we take away? This is a hard one. This is a really hard one. And the key is, as we're looking at this issue, whatever side of the issue you're on, what the, I think the questions that we all need to ask ourselves is, how am I, in my actions, in my attitude, especially my attitude, my secret thoughts, if you will, am I glorifying God 
in those secret thoughts and in that attitude when I present whatever my opinion is. And if you have someone who has the opposite opinion, you know what? Love them. Seek to talk to them. Seek to understand them. See if they can understand you. And even if you can't agree, perhaps you can come to a sense of, of mutual respect and whatever happens, the two of you can respect each other. So make it a personal thing. Make it a personal thing and not this thing where we get go off on it, whatever side of the issue you might be on. Again, finally, let's get the scriptures to help us deal with this. Scriptural guidelines for hearing the right voices. Jonathan, our final scripture here in this, in this context is Galatians 3, 23 and 24. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. You know, the Bible, one of the nice things, one of the good things about the Bible is it doesn't, it, 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 it shows the ugly parts of people. And that seems you know, counterintuitive, but if all the mistakes in the Bible weren't recorded, we wouldn't have all the lessons that we need because bad things play a part in God's plan too. It's how we learn now, and it'll be a touchstone of remembrance in God's future kingdom. And when we look at the heroes of faith, we look at their flaws and we look at their trials, we look at their failures, and we look at their victories, and we look at how they're blessed by God. We look at the whole picture, the whole package, and we learn from the mistakes. So we have to be really careful in, in putting this all together so that we are still able to see and acknowledge the depth of mistake. That's what the scriptures tell us to do. So Jonathan, wrapping this up, listening to the right voices, what do we have? A godly voice is one that not only appreciates the history that led God's plan to Christ, but truly honors it as well. Such a voice absorbs the hard life lessons of all God's faithful heroes and keeps them alive. Any voice that seeks to alter the past by burying it is not a voice that appreciates the magnitude of God's plan. And just to make sure that we're clear, what voices should we be listening to? It is really a simple thing. We should be listening to the voice of God that is presented to us in Scripture and through those who truly serve him. Now, that doesn't mean other people's voices are completely bad. If they are using scriptural principle and and, and the morality that Scripture show us, those are good things. So let's make sure that all of our listening is done with the idea that God be glorified in whatever I let into my brain. How about that? If God cannot be glorified by the voices that you're letting into your brain, then those voices should exit immediately because that's the bottom line. And, and, you know, the other bottom line is this. Listen for the voice of Jesus in your daily life because if you don't find that voice now, you're going to find it later. Jesus himself says, though, in Matthew, in John 5, 28 and 29, he says, don't marvel at this. An hour is coming in which all who are in their tombs will hear, essentially, his voice. They will hear the voice of Jesus and come forth, some to a resurrection of of life and some to a resurrection of judgment. The bottom line is every man, woman, and child will get to hear the voice of Jesus and then have an opportunity to make right the things they didn't make right in this life. That's the beauty of looking for God's voice. We look to the scriptures, we look to the principles, we put those on, uh, in, in front of us, behind us, around us, in our pockets, uh, in our books, on our computer, on our phones, so that wherever we go, whatever we do, it's the voice of God, and get rid of the voices that are hurtful and painful and sinful. Just put them away. Think about it. Folks, listen, we really want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our podcast is subscribing to Christian Questions in your favorite podcast channel, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate us and review us. We greatly appreciate it. Coming up next week, kind of building off of this, off of the idea of what are the voices that you listen to, Next week, our big question is, is the devil in the details of my life? Is the devil in the details of my life? Talk to you next week.